So now we're going to go into social behavior with other groups. So yes, ethnocentrism and cultural relativism. So this is associated with, um, you know, different ethnic groups or cultural groups. And so you'll see here. So ethnocentric means like judging someone else's culture from the position of your own culture. Um, and in ethnocentrism, you kind of believe that your culture is superior to other cultures, which can event can lead to cultural bias and prejudice of how you view other cultures in yourselves. Um, and then on the other hand, there's a view of cultural relativism, which is the practice of assessing a culture by its own standards. And so that you are understanding that other cultures um, are a little bit different than yourselves. So you're trying to judge and understand that culture from their, their perspective instead of you know, your perspective as what ethnocentrism would be more like. Um, and then xenocentrism is when you're judging another culture as superior to your own culture. Um, cultural imperialism is the deliberate imposition of your own cultural values onto another culture. Um, and then, so I kind of also then went into groups because within each of these cultural groups, there is a sense of understanding what a primary group is, which is the closest members of the group to you personally, and then secondary groups, which are formal, impersonal, and temporary um, business-like relationships that you kind of just make in order to fulfill a goal um, of the group, probably, like especially in a business-like setting. Um, and then there is also an in-group, which is the group that we are connected with, and people tend to have more favoritism for that in-group. And you know, within these in-groups, they kind of share certain connections, um, have similar ideas, and so that's what allows them to attribute themselves as being a certain group. Versus out-group, which is the group that you're not associated with and don't feel connected to, and so that's the kind of group that you're looking out at. So like with ethnocentrism, um, your culture would be that in-group and then you're viewing that other culture as that out-group. Okay, and then, um, so last week we mentioned a little bit, so this is a little bit going on with like in-group and out-group, but also building on what we learned about last week with um, immigrants and how their process or their ability to assimilate into society is a little bit different. Um, and that's how come it kind of separates them from like others in the, in the population. And so assimilation is the process by which a minority integrates socially, culturally, and or politically into a larger dominant culture and society. Um, so some of the different factors at which others assess or researchers tend to assess um, the ability to assimilate into other cultures is uh, socioeconomic status, which is you know educational attainment. It's a mixture that leads to educational attainment, occupation, and also their income. And this is compared to native born individuals. So if they tend to be more, you know, like the native born individuals that would help them assimilate better. Um, and then also spatial concentration. So increasing, because of the concentration, it allows them to increase their socioeconomic attainment and also having a longer residence in the, for example, if we're saying assimilation to the US, then longer residence in the US and a higher generational status, which ends up leading to a decrease in the residential concentration for a particular ethnic group. And so um, being able to kind of be a little bit more spread out, but also having longer residence in 
in a certain area allows them to continue reproducing in that area and then also um, assimilating more to the certain culture because you know their children grew up in that particular area. And then language attainment, which is the, so this is associated with the three generation model of language assimilation. Um, basically that as the generations keep on going, um, the most recent generations would be more fluent in the language that is spoken in that area that they're living in. So if it was in the US, then the third generation or the latest one would speak only English. Um, and so the ability to speak the same language as the larger dominant culture um, would increase assimilation. And then also intermarriage, which is, um, you know, when you're marrying with other members of that dominant culture. And it tends to be that high rates of intermarriage are a indication of social integration. And then this intermarriage reduces actually the ability of families to pass on the, the ethnic culture that they originally had if they were you know, an immigrant coming from another culture. And so that causes the children to become more assimilated in that larger culture because that is what they are able to know better. And then um, regarding, you know, the previous slides where we we're talking about just assimilation and also looking at different cultures, there are the ideas of first stigma, which is um, extreme disapproval of a person based on some behavior or quality of that person. And so it's usually you'll see a culture or a subculture, it tends to stigmatize a person based on overt physical deformations. Um, so that's like a physical disability or other kinds of personal traits that deviate from the norm, which an example would be drug addiction or also from the norms of their particular group. And so an example is being a loose woman in traditional Latino subculture, which these are all different examples of stigma within a culture. Um, and eventually social stigma can potentially develop into self stigma um, and viewing yourself in the same way that society views you. And just a note is that the actions of stigma can be done by yourself, by your family, society, and media, and all these different factors um, or individuals that are seeing certain things about you or your culture or, you know, um, whatever particularly it is that the stigma is. Um, and then we kind of segue into also gender roles um, because, you know, there is stigma about, you know, as we mentioned, kind of different cultures, but there are also stigmas about different genders and, um, or like roles of different genders. And so gender roles are a set of societal norms dictating what types of behaviors are generally considered acceptable, appropriate, or desirable for a person based on their actual or perceived sex. So this tends to be supported through media, school, cultural teachings, and more actually, um, like it's just kind of taught through all of these methods, um, in addition to sometimes being supported by them. And so, you know, some common ideas of gender roles is that women are assigned to take care of the family and stay at home, should be more feminine, emotional, soft, and submissive. While men, on the other hand, are, you know, have been kind of seen as those that go to work or war, they should be masculine, aggressive, tough, and dominant um, in their gender role. But on the other hand, there's also different concepts related to roles and the different roles an individual may have. So one is role strain. So this is tensions within a status and an individual is having a tough time carrying out all the obligations of that status. So we could give an example of like 
a mom who just, you know, has to, has a lot of stuff to juggle with while taking care of her child and going to work and taking care of the household. So there are times when sometimes there is a lot of strain on that activity and that would be that role strain. But remember for role strain, it's within one status. It's not like different types. But then here on the other hand with role conflict, this is conflict or tension between two or more different statuses. So um, like an individual having different roles. So if we gave the example of the mom with you know, taking care of her children, taking care of the household, that's all within like that mom kind of role. But then if we also think of her as like the leader of her company, then that's kind of like an additional status role that we're, we're thinking of here. And just the tasks for both of these activities conflict or have a lot of tension between um, for, for that individual's, for that example of that woman's time, um, it would probably be really hard to juggle all of these different things. And so that would be role conflict where, you know, it's between those two different, two or more different statuses. And then there's also the term of role exit, which is when an individual stops engaging in a previous role at all and um, kind of lets that go and establishes a new identity. And so they just kind of dismiss their, their previous role. And so now we're at another question. So here we have everyone saying choice B, um, which is great, you guys, because the answer is choice B. Um, so I'm gonna quickly go over this. Jane and her friends are discussing the culture of their new friend, James. Jane suggests that his culture is different and it would help to understand his culture to make better judgments about similarities and differences between the friends, the friend group's culture. What view is Jane taking? And because she is noticing that his culture is different and she wants to understand his culture better through you know, making an effort to understand it, that's why it's cultural relativism. As you remember the, um, from the terms of four, when we were going over it, um, like ethnocentrism is when you're kind of viewing your culture as superior to others. Xenocentrism, you believe others are superior to yours and cultural imperialism when you're putting your ideas onto the others. So that's why the answer is B. 